Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. This is going to be an audio version of an article. Not an article that I have written, but an article that was written uh, by someone else named Jean-Marc Berthoud. And the, his last name is spelled B-E-R-T-H-O-U-D, if I am mispronouncing it. Uh, this article that Berthoud has written uh, was titled, Is Textual Criticism to be Feared? It appeared in the journal Christianity and Society, volume 12, number 4, in October of 2002, and it appears there on pages 24 through 28. Uh, just a little bit about Berthoud from an author blurb that appears on the back of uh, one of his books, Authority in the Christian Life. It says, Author John Mark Berthoud was born in 1939 in South Africa and currently resides in Lausanne, Switzerland. He is a Christian apologist, historian, philosopher, theologian, and author of many books and numerous articles. And I did receive his permission uh, to record this audio version of this article. Again, the article is titled, is textual criticism to be feared? And with that, let's go ahead and begin this uh, reading of this brief article. Textual criticism is a subject all too often ignored in evangelical and confessionally reformed circles. In a general way, textual criticism, what Germanic theological jargon calls lower criticism, to distinguish it from a pretended higher criticism, which has for quite some time labored at the literary deconstruction of the Bible, is quite well received in Christian circles which still remain attached to the doctrines of the infallibility and authority of the Bible. To speak in a general way, higher criticism with its panoply of methods, its search for the sources of the text under consideration, its hypotheses as to the dating of the books of the Bible, on the divergent theologies of Paul, John, Peter, its speculations on the form of the text, and so on, is still considered by these traditional circles with certain suspicion, even though they often afford these critics more attention than they deserve. But this is in no way the case for lower criticism or textual criticism, the presuppositions of which have been adopted by the, for the establishment of the Greek text of most of our modern translations of the New Testament. Thus, many passages in our French Bibles are printed enclosed in square brackets, and the notes which accompany the brackets are often marked by indications according to which such and such a passage is not found in the oldest manuscripts or in the best manuscripts. The reader who, struck by such indications, would like to know more is, to say the least, left unsatisfied by the absence of reasons given for such apparently arbitrary affirmations. Why, he may ask, should a manuscript of the oldest type, i.e. of the 4th century, written in Greek capitals, be necessarily considered better than a newer manuscript of the 9th century written in small type? Is a Jehovah's Witness Bible, dating from the beginning of the 20th century, necessarily better than a Colomb Bible printed at the end of the 20th? Must one deduce that the criterion of time should be considered absolute? What is the basis for such remarks? The first method of establishing the text of the New Testament we shall consider is that utilized for the first time in its modern phase in 1516, both by Erasmus and Basil, and at the same time in Spain by a team of biblical scholars under the direction of Cardinal Jimenez. These two texts were established from the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament according to the textual tradition we now call Byzantine. The second method, which is commonly called the eclectic tradition, took off essentially following Tischendorf's discovery in 1859 of a very ancient text of the New Testament in a monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. The conclusions he drew from this discovery were confirmed by the contemporary revelation of a very similar manuscript long hidden in the Vatican Library. This text, which came to be known as the Vaticanus, 
also originated from the 4th century Alexandrine text. This method has since held a dominant position in academic circles. The first school of textual criticism that inaugurated by Erasmus and Amenes is today almost completely unknown, even in evangelical and reformed academic circles, desirous of being faithful to the inspiration and authority of the Bible. Let us briefly indicate a number of factual errors in the position defended by the advocates of the eclectic method of textual criticism. It is wrong, for example, to affirm, as is commonly done in these circles, that scholars have only recently begun to take interest in biblical quotations of the fathers, as well as in those found in lectionaries, anthologies of liturgical texts drawn from the Bible. To prove the contrary, one has only to examine the impressive researches in this field of the greatest opponent in the 19th century of the new critical method, John William Bergen, from, who lived from 1813 to 1888. Bergen, in opposition to his eclectic colleagues, scholars like Tischendorf, Westcott, and Hort, and their numerous disciples, who consistently based their work on the texts of the Alexandrian tradition, and in particular, the two oldest complete manuscripts in the New Testament, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, made the fullest use of all the patristic documents available to him. This included quotations of the Bible from the writings of the fathers and those found in liturgical lectionaries in use in the early church. It is his exemplary knowledge of the latter which enabled him to give an explanation of the fact that the text of the account of the woman taken in adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, is not to be found in a small number of ancient manuscripts of the Gospel of John and is placed in another section of this Gospel. As Bergen has admirably demonstrated in his Pericope de Adultera, the essential reason for the absence of this passage in certain manuscripts and its introduction elsewhere in others is the fact that these manuscripts were not texts figuring in copies of the New Testament, but in liturgical lectionaries, selections of biblical texts to be read during the celebration of church services. We must here add that our remarks are solely addressed to the critical study of the manuscripts of the New Testament, for which there exists an impressive number of variants, and not to the manuscripts of the Jewish Tanakh, our Old Testament, for the latter was exceptionally well preserved by the Masoretic textual tradition. This brings us to our second point. It is wrong to establish, as some do, an imaginary dialectical opposition between a so-called scientific camp, on the one hand, the defenders of the eclectic method, and on the other, a so-called fundamentalist party, defending the traditional attitude. The latter, we are told, is made up of dogmatic adherents of the received ecclesiastical or traditional texts of the New Testament. These two tendencies are usually opposed one to the other. Others, in a typical Hegelian manner, seek to resolve this opposition by a synthesis, a type of compromise solution, thus attempting the reconciliation of the irreconcilable. If they can continue to accuse the traditional position for its pretended dogmatism, they also attack the eclectic method for its pretended dictatorial methods seeking, as it does, to impose by force on all the results of the so-called scientific logic, establishing thus a kind of intellectual tyranny on all schools of scholarly thought. Those who favor this dialectic solution accuse the advocates of the so-called scientific method of practicing a type of intellectual terrorism. But what makes such a dialectical solution quite impossible is that the scientific fundamentalist opposition is in itself false. In fact, there are always, there has always existed, and there still exists, two schools of textual criticism in the New Testament. Both hold to strictly scientific pretensions. Their methodological principles are, however, very different. They are, in fact, thoroughly antithetical. The eclectic method in question can be described as follows. A variety of differing texts, considered to be of equal value, are examined by the textual critics without any kind of doctrinal a priori, but following a number of specific technical rules, doctrinal positions, 
Doctrinal positions are considered partisan, but methods are neutral. From this variety of reading, since the word eclectic, they pick, in terms of the methods used, what they consider to be the most correct reading of the passage under consideration. They seek thus to reconstruct the original text, considered lost, of the New Testament. The text of the New Testament is thus placed at the same ontological and epistemological level as any other literary text. For the advocates of the eclectic method, there is no essential difference between, between the Bible and any other book. The great figures of this tradition are such eminent scholars as Lachman, Tischendorf, Tregelis, Westcott and Hort, Nessel, Aland, and Metzger. This tradition explicitly rejects the presupposition which founded the older school of textual criticism. For, according to the traditional school, the Holy Spirit has been, and still is, objectively active in history so as to affect the very real preservation of the authentic or original text of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit thus protects the New Testament text from the weakness and the malice of men as well as from the attacks of the devil. As Jakob von Bruggen points out, this method is today universally accepted. Quote, One can even say that the modern textual criticism of the New Testament is based on the one fundamental conviction that the true text of the New Testament is at least not found in the great majority of the manuscripts. This rejection of the traditional text, that is the text preserved and handed down in the churches, is hardly written or thought about anymore in the 20th century. It is a fait accompli. A critical examination of the reasons for rejecting the Byzantine text soon encounters the difficulty that this rejection is accepted as a fact in the 20th century but not defended as a proposition, end quote. The philosophical origins of the eclectic text are to be found in the rationalistic spirit of the Enlightenment. It is one of the intellectual fruits of modern autonomous thought, i.e., thought freed from the constraints of the Word of God, but freed also from the obligation of submitting its methods to the very nature of the object studied. Second, the other tradition amiably baptized by its critics with the expression fundamentalist rationalism, also claims to defend clearly defined scientific principles. However, placing their methodology under the authority of the teachings of the New Testament, these defenders of the traditional method also submit their methods to the nature of the object they are studying. In fact, they take with methodological seriousness the infallibility and divine authority of the Holy Scriptures. Thus, for them, this book has a specific and unique character. This requires an appropriate and unique method of study. This fact places all those who study this very special book in a systematically Christian perspective, in a position which forces them to use a method appropriate to the specific ontological and epistemological status of the Bible. For the Bible itself states that its ultimate author is the Holy Spirit, and that th this divine author is also its constant preserver. Here we can do no better than to quote the very enlightening remarks of the Calvinist textual critical scholar, the great connoisseur of these questions, Edward F. Hills. He was trained at Westminster Theological Seminary, sitting under the teaching of John Murray, Edward J. Young, and Cornelius Van Til. He later pursued his academic career at Yale and Harvard. Here is what he writes, quote, Thus, there are two methods of New Testament textual criticism, the consistently Christian method and the naturalistic method. These two methods deal with the same materials, the same Greek manuscripts, and the same translations and biblical quotations. But they interpret these materials differently. The consistently Christian method interprets the materials of the New Testament textual criticism in accordance with the doctrines of the divine inspiration and providential preservation of the scriptures. The naturalistic method interprets these same materials in accordance with its own doctrine that the New Testament is nothing more than a human book, end quote. And Hill adds, quote, Sad to say, modern Bible-believing scholars have taken very little interest in the concept of consistently Christian New Testament textual criticism. For more than a century, most of them have been quite content to follow in this area the naturalistic methods of Tischendorf, Tregelis, and Westcott and Hort. And the result of this equivocation has been truly disastrous. 
Just as in Pharaoh's dream, the thin cows ate up the fat cows. So the principles and procedures of naturalistic New Testament textual criticism have spread into every department of Christian thought and produced spiritual famine, end quote. Hill's work is but the culmination in the 20th century of a much older tradition of study of the manuscript texts in the New Testament. This tradition was at the same time both rigorously scientific and based on coherent methodological presuppositions in harmony with the Bible's own teaching on the question. This textual tradition was eventually called the ecclesiastical tradition of textual criticism, for it was based on texts received as being authentic and thus authoritative in the Eastern Orthodox Church. To this tradition belong such eminent scholars as Cardinal Jimenez of the Complutensian School in Spain, Erasmus of Rotterdam, Robert Estion, editor of the Stephanus text, Theodore of Beza, the Dutch Elzevirs who established the Textus Receptus, John Owen, and David Martin, the famous reviser of the French Bible in 1707. This version, which was recently re-edited in Dallas by a Pentecostal missionary organization, is one of the rare editions of the French Bible today available, which is based on the ecclesiastical tradition of the biblical text. The situation is different in English, where the King James Version is readily available. In German, where Luther's Bible is constantly republished, or even in Spanish, where the Reina Valera version is easy to find. This ecclesiastical tradition of textual scholarship was ably carried forward in the 19th and 20th centuries, both in England and in the United States. Amongst the eminent figures who stand out in this little-known school of textual criticism, we find such names as John William Bergen, T.R. Burks, E. Miller, F.H.A. Scribner in the 19th century. Then in the 20th, such men as Edward F. Hills, Wilbur N. Pickering, Theodore Letus, Jakob von Bruggen of the Theological Reform College of Kampen in the Netherlands. A revised critical edition of the traditional text of the New Testament is today again available in an edition established by Zane Hodges and Arthur Farstad. The traditional or ecclesiastical position defended by this school is not only based on scrupulously scientific study of the text, but on the self-conscious conformity of the method adopted to the standards of Reformed confessions. Here is what the Westminster Confession affirms, quote, The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which, at the time of the writing of it, was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God, and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentical, end quote. At this point is indicated the following biblical reference, Matthew 5.18, to which we could add Revelation 22.18 and 19. For I testify that every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And in that last of Reformed Confessional Confessions, the Helvetic Consensus Formula of 1675, we can read in the first canon, quote, God, the supreme judge, not only took care to have his word, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, committed to writings by Moses, the prophets, and the apostles, but has also watched and cherished it with paternal care ever since it was written up to the present time so that it could not be corrupted by the craft of Satan or the fraud of man. Therefore, the church justly ascribes it to his singular grace and goodness that she has and will have to the end of the world a sure word of prophecy and holy scriptures 2 Timothy 3.15, from which, though heaven and earth perish, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass, Matthew 5.18. A certain number of clarificatory remarks are here in order. The text, uh, first, the textual problems raised by a certain number of manuscripts, less than 20%, only concerns the New Testament for the text of the Old Testament, 
for the text of the Old Testament was so carefully copied by the Masoretic scribes that very few errors were introduced. Second, the immense majority, between 80% and 90% of the manuscripts of the New Testament currently available, which are texts of the ecclesiastical tradition of the Eastern Church in minuscule letters, are in all essential points unanimous. Only very minor, different readings remain. On this last point, Wilbur Pickering writes, quote, The argument from statistical probability enters here with a vengeance. Not only do the extant manuscripts present us with one text form enjoying an 80 to 90 percent majority, but the remaining 10 to 20 percent do not represent a single competing text form. The minority manuscripts disagree as much or more among themselves as they do with the majority. Or to take a specific case, in 1 Timothy 3.16, over 300 Greek manuscripts read God, while only 11 read something else. Of those 11, two have private readings, two have a third reading, and seven agree in reading who. So we have to judge between 97% and 2%. It's hard to imagine any possible set of circumstances in which the transmissional history sufficient to produce the cataclysmic overthrow in statistical probability required by the claim that who is the original reading, end quote. What is little known is the complete dead end into which the, ecclesi- the eclectic tradition of textual study of the New Testament has today pushed itself. No one in these circles considers any longer that by the use of these critical tools of almost universal acceptance in academia, one can ever hope to discover the authoritative original text of the New Testament. It is this methodological uncertainty which Jakob von Bruggen describes in considering the desperate situation in which the eclectic editors of the New Testament find themselves. Quote, This again means an acquiescence in a consensus text which has been determined on the basis of uncertainty. This time, no mean from three modern text editions like the older Nestle, but the mean of the opinions of five modern textual critics, Aland, Black, Martini, Metzger, Wittgren, together have established a text by majority vote. It is clear from the textual commentary of Metzger on this text that there are many readings which have been chosen only by the majority of the committee. That they did not unanimously arrive at a text is also not surprising. At present, there is no certainty concerning the history of the textual tradition, lest the agreement concerning the text edition to be used camouflages the uncertainty which prevails during the fixation of the text. Three, uh, that's the end of the quotation. Three, the age of a manuscript does not by itself necessarily guarantee either its quality or even its authenticity. As we have already shown in the ancient as we have already shown, the ancient manuscripts written in capital letters, such as the Vaticanus or the Sinaiticus, dating from the 4th century, are not, by the sole consideration of their antiquity, good texts in the New Testament. This is equally the case for the numerous papyri discovered in the sands of Egypt during the course of the 20th century. The majority of these fragments of the New Testament represent, in fact, very defective copies. It may well be that the astonishing preservation of the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus text is essentially due to the fact that, as defective copies, they they were never put to liturgical use and were thus never destroyed by constant practice. Such a physical preservation occurs similarly with a Jehovah's Witness Bible resting unused on the shelves of a Christian home from which it is never taken down for family worship. It would obviously be preserved much longer than the Orthodox Bible in constant use for personal and communal worship. Four, we may now raise the the decisive question. Is it possible to exclude faith from any truly scientific research on the New Testament? The tradition of textual criticism which pretends to the exclusive methodology appropriate to the scientific study of the New Testament tradition, which goes from Lachman and Tischendorf to such modern scholars as Nessel, Aland, and Metzger, and includes the work of men like Westcott and Hort and Tregalis, not forgetting the prestigious name of Warfield, affirms categorically that faith is here not in any way necessary. 
Indeed, in their view, the intrusion of considerations relative to faith in textual studies would automatically disqualify the scholar who has the temerity of adopting such a position from the respect of authorized, the authorized from the respect of the authorized scientific community. In this, they adopt the eminent perspective, which is that of modernity, a perspective which considers the Bible as it would any other book. Thus, in this view, the study of textual criticism, whatever the text might be, dispenses with the scholar's faith in its effort to establish by scientific means the true text of the New Testament. These scholars function intellectually as if this text did not in fact proceed from the revelatory action of a transcendent God, manifesting in this way his divine supernatural power. The holiness of the divinity was thus communicated to the very character of the written text in which we find God's revelation, which we rightly name the Holy Scriptures. Thus, this methodology, methodologically atheistic scholarly tradition implicitly affirms that the text of the scriptures in no way needs for its very preservation from the attacks of the devil, from the destructive malice of men and from the natural weakness of copyists, the protective and uh, preserving action of the Holy Spirit. Things are very different with regard to the ecclesiastical method of textual criticism. Here, in what we must unashamedly call the truly scientific study of the manuscripts of the New Testament, the ecclesiastical method directly takes into methodological consideration the supernatural character of the object of its research. We have seen how the textual traditions of the ancient church, resurrected by the labors of humanist scholars at the time of the Reformation, and carried forward by the Bergens, the Scriveners, the Hills, the Hodges, and the Pickerings of the past two centuries, integrate into their truly scientific study of the sacred text, respect for the marvelous supernatural manner in which our sovereign God revealed and preserved and continues to preserve these sacred writings. For God indeed keeps them free from the errors produced by a false science which rejects the sacred character of the object of its study. In fact, in this particular domain, so-called academic scholarship systematically refuses to place God within the very workings of the scholarly mind. It is here that we must carefully heed the apostle's warning. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Colossians 2.8 Conclusion Let us end with a question. What can be the use of the most absolute doctrine of the inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy of the original manuscripts of the Bible, such as that taught by B.B. Warfield, for example, if the text in our hands is not entirely worthy of our trust? In opposition to the doubts which the deceitful practices and the errors of a science which excludes all knowledge of God from the methodology it has adopted for the study of the Bible might raise in our minds, let us quietly declare that this book in our hands, inspired and preserved by God, is indeed what it affirms to be, the very word of the living God. For God has watched with such care over the transmission of the Holy Word through the ages that, in spite of the falsifications produced by those who put themselves in the place of the Holy Spirit as judges of what, it, what in this book is of God and what is not of him, we can still today hold in our hands God's very revelation to men. In spite of the numerous new French translations of the Bible, to speak only of the French-speaking world, based on uncertain texts, it is, by God's grace, still possible today to find translations grounded on the traditional texts of Holy Scripture, as originally inspired by God, and as it has over the centuries been received and preserved in the church. Thus, with the presence in our midst of the Martin, Osterwald, and Trinitarian Society French translations of the true text of the Bible, it is possible for men to read in French the infallible witness of God to the thoughts he chose to reveal to men for their salvation. Here ends the article. You can uh, receive audiobook reviews and articles and notes like this one 
Word Magazine podcasts and sermons, by subscribing to Christ Reformed Baptist Church's sermon audio feed on iTunes, by searching for Christ Reformed Baptist Church. For video material, you can subscribe to the Word Magazine channel on youtube.com. You can also find written book reviews, articles, and notes on my blog at jeffriddle.net. And you can follow me on Twitter or X at Riddle1689.